All right, let's take a look at section 16.7. I'm just going to cover surface integrals. So the learning objectives this time are we're going to try to calculate and define surface integrals, both in terms of scalar functions and in terms of vector functions, uh, and then also define and visualize the orientation of a surface. All right, well, let's get started with the definition of a surface integral. Uh, so with these surface integrals, we're going to try to take the idea of a line integral, which we covered back in chapter 14, uh, and expand that into uh, a three dimension, into three dimensions. So instead of just looking at a single line that passes through two or maybe three dimensions, we can have an area that can pass through two or three dimensions. Uh, so this area could be a, the surface that we're looking at will probably be a curved surface. At least it can be a curved surface. So it can curve its way through R3. It's not just limited to being stuck in R2. Uh, but yeah, let's get into that definition. So we're going to start by taking some parameterization of our surface S. Most of the time we're going to call that R. Uh, in terms of two new variables, which will be u and v, and u and v will exist in the d space, so the region d, which is going to be an image of s. Uh, but we'll define that surface integral of a scalar function f across the surface s to be uh, the surface integral on the region s of f times ds can instead be the double integral over a region d, where we have our function of its parameterization, or the function of the parameterization of the surface, and then multiplied by the partial of R with U cross the partial of R with V, the magnitude of that times dA. So there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so let's start by talking about a little bit of what's going on. So first notice that we're taking these integrals over two different, two different regions. Uh, so we're, work, we're starting, we're relating a surface integral on a surface S to some other region D uh, that's just in two space. And that's where our functions U and V are going to be defined. Also, we're looking at the magnitude of a cross product uh, where we're taking the cross product of two partial derivatives of our parameterization, one with respect to each of the two variables, u and v. So if we take the partial of r with respect to u, that is going to give us one vector that lies in the tangent plane. If we take the partial of r with respect to v, that'll give us a second vector that also lies in that tangent plane. Meaning if we take the cross product of those two partial derivatives, we're going to get a vector that is normal to the surface or normal to the tangent plane at each point. Uh, so R u cross R v gives us a normal vector. Uh, but let's try and put that into practice. Now this first example gets a little insane. So we'll try and work our way through it. Uh, so our goal is to going to be to compute the surface integral of z squared on a surface S where that surface is just the unit sphere. So x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one, or alternatively, rho equals one, if we want to change this thing into, surf into spherical coordinates. There we go. So step one is going to be to parameterize our surface S. So again, we're, we, what we have is the surface of the unit sphere. So we already have a relatively straightforward parameterization for S, and that'll be to go with spherical coordinates, uh, which is almost effectively uh, what our vector R is. We're just fixing our radius to be one. So if rho is one, uh, then X is gonna be cosine theta times sine phi y will be sine theta times sine phi, and z will be cosine of phi, where theta and phi are defined uh, in the way that we use them for spherical coordinates. So theta will be the angle between the positive x-axis and wherever our point is in space, measured counterclockwise, and phi will be the angle between our radius and the z-axis, 
All right, so now that we have a parameterization, the next step is to going to be to find the magnitude of that cross product of the two partial derivatives. So first step in finding that magnitude is going to be to take each of those partial derivatives, which are listed here and here. Those being our two partial derivatives, first with respect to theta, then with respect to phi. And then we need to take magnitude of that cross product. So I've done my best to show all of the steps involved in calculating that magnitude. So if we look at each of the individual pieces being highlighted here in magenta, uh, each piece is the i, j, and k element of that cross product. Write it r theta cross r phi in that order. If you had switched the order, these would have all come out positive instead of negative but that's fine because we're gonna end up taking a magnitude anyway. Uh, so when we're taking a magnitude, we need to square each of those components, add that up and then take the square root of the whole thing. So notice this power of one half over here where we're gonna take the square root at the end uh, and then work our way through everything that we've got going on. So, in the first step, uh, notice that in the rightmost term, I have a sine squared and a cosine squared being multiplied into sine phi cosine phi in both of those cases. Uh, so I can factor out a sine phi and a cosine phi and I'm just left with a sine squared plus cosine squared. Also, I'm just gonna factor that negative one out because it can just get squared away. So that's also why everything ends up positive in the next line because I'm squaring each piece. But that sine squared plus cosine squared, both of theta means that I can add that up to one. Since I'm going to be using the identity sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals one quite a bit, or at least three times throughout this whole process. So step one, I'm gonna just make that substitution. Uh, dealing with the left two terms, each of those has a factor of sine squared, which is really sine to the fourth because each of those things are being squared. So I'm gonna factor that out. And that leaves us with a cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta again. Uh, so that I can use my identity one more time and say that that cosine squared plus sine squared, both of theta are equal to one as we have right here, just moving, moving on down the line. Uh, then what I would be left with there is sine to the fourth power, but I'm gonna break that apart so that I can simplify this a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna split up sine to the fourth into sine squared times sine squared. And then I'll change one of those pieces that is sine squared into one minus cosine squared now of phi since I've managed to reduce theta from the whole problem. So now I have sine squared times one minus cosine squared plus that sine squared plus cosine squared, all of that of phi. Uh, and if I simplify that, I'm gonna have a plus sine squared cosine squared, both of phi and a minus sine squared times cosine squared, again, both of phi. So those pieces add up to zero, meaning all I'm left with is sine squared of phi I'll need to take the square root of that, which ultimately gives us sine phi. So through that whole process, if we're trying to find the magnitude of the cross product of those partial derivatives of the parameterization, where our parameterization is spherical coordinates, we end up with sine phi when rho is one. And in fact, if we use a spherical coordinate parameterization like this, uh, for rho being any other number, we should get rho squared sine phi when we do all this mess, which should sound familiar because that's the component that we have to multiply in whenever we use dv in spherical coordinates. So all that work to get a sine phi, which is going to show up in the next step. Since we want to calculate this surface integral of z squared. So we'll replace ds then 
which in our case, ds is going to be all the work that we just put in to find sine phi from the step over uh, step two, and then multiplied by d theta d phi. Or I guess the way I have it written, d phi d theta. So we'll also change over z to be cosine of phi, since that's what we had for z in our parameterization. Uh, so z squared becomes cosine squared of phi, multiplied by sine phi times d theta, d phi d theta. And we're going to integrate all the way through that unit sphere, which means theta goes from zero to two pi, phi goes from zero to one pi. If we take that integration, we again have a separable function. So I can separate out my theta piece and my phi piece. The theta piece will just integrate to two pi. Uh, the phi component, I've got cosine squared times sine phi. So I can integrate up to cosine cubed over three. Yep. Or rather, that should have integrated to negative cosine cubed over three, uh, since the derivative of cosine should be negative sine. So we integrate to negative one third cosine cubed of phi. And then we evaluate that thing from zero to pi. If we plug in pi, we'll get negative one for cosine. If we plug in zero, we'll get positive one for cosine. Uh, so uh, plugging all that in, I got four pi over three. Yeah. Okay, we try that again. Uh, this time we'll look at a more explicit surface uh, for our for S. Uh, and we can say that if our surface is given by the equation G of X and Y, then we have a slightly different formula that we can use. It's really just the same formula, but it's gonna be condensed for us a bit more. So we don't have to go through the process of finding, uh, of finding the cross product of our two partial derivative vectors. So uh, what that means, so if our surface can be expressed as a function of only x and y, uh, that means we can call our, our z variable uh, can just be that surface equation. It'll be z equals a function, that function of g, that function g of x and y, uh, and if we actually calculate the cross product of those two partial derivative vectors, we end up getting from the cross product uh, the negative partial of z with respect to x and the negative partial of z with respect to y and then just one in the third component. And if we take the magnitude of that, we're gonna get uh, exactly what we have in the theorem box. So this piece right here so the square root of the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared plus one. Uh, so something I use as a, as a trick when I'm trying to keep all this stuff straight uh, is rather than calling z the function g of x and y, we can just replace z with the function z of x and y. So in these cases where I'm taking a partial derivative of z with respect to x and then with respect to y, z is really a function there, not just a variable, which is why I get a partial derivative instead of just zero. Uh, so I know that the text usually calls it the function g. Um, in these notes, I'll oftentimes just call that the function z instead of the variable z. Uh, but we get another double integral, just like we had in the previous example, uh, where we'll have a known magnitude of a cross product, which just lets us skip the longest step from the previous example, if we happen to have a nice looking surface. Uh, so into our second example, uh, we'll evaluate uh, the surface integral of y, where s is the surface z equals x plus y squared, and we're gonna go over the region where x is between zero and one and y is between zero and two. 
So this fits the previous theorem uh, where our surface can be expressed as a function of just x and y, uh, meaning that we can just plug everything in. Uh, so for starters, we need the partial of z with respect to x and the partial of z with respect to y. I got one and two y respectively. So I'll square those things and then put them on the inside of that square root as we had mentioned before. So we can see that piece coming from up here. So we end up with the double integral of y times the square root of one plus four y squared plus one, where again, that's coming from the formula. Uh, and in this case, I'm gonna integrate first with respect to y and then x. Uh, and once again, we have a separable function uh, since our integrand depends only on y. So I'll separate out an x integral and a y integral. The x integral will just integrate to one since it goes between zero and one. So that part's pretty straightforward. Then for the y integral, that one gets to be a bit more fun, but it's just a relatively straightforward u substitution. Uh, we'll use u equals four y squared plus two. Uh, and after integrating and changing back to y, I got the uh, expression listed right here. So one eighth times two thirds times four y squared plus two to the three halves. Then plugging in two and zero and evaluating, uh, I ended up getting 13 times the square root of two over three. It took a bit of simplification to get there, but nothing too bad if you wanna try that yourself. Okay, now into some more definitions. Uh, so trying to call a surface an oriented surface. Uh, the text goes into, well, it's just a lot more of a wordy definition. So I'm gonna try and boil it down into something that's just a bit easier to understand. Uh, so I'm gonna start with sort of three points. An F, a surface S is going to be oriented if it has two sides. Uh, and then an orientation of a surface is just a choice of picking one of those two sides. Uh, so maybe a top and a bottom or a left and a right or whatever orientations we could have. We'll talk about which ones we're actually gonna use in a moment. Uh, and then finally, we'll call a surface closed if it is the boundary of a solid region. Basically what that means, surface is closed if you know, say I've got a ball and I wanna just look at the surface of that ball then that surface would be a closed surface because it fully encompasses a solid region. Uh, as opposed to a just simply two-dimensional surface that doesn't close back in on itself. So just maybe, you know, think of like a sheet in the wind. Wouldn't really be a closed surface because it's not enclosing any solid region. So it's not enclosing a solid volume. So you could think of a closed surface as one that has a volume inside it whereas a non-closed surface does not have any volume. But enough about that. Uh, let's actually try and make some sense of what that all means. So for starters, I wanna say that we will mostly be focusing on two natural orientations, which we'll call upwards and outwards. Uh, but first to give us a better idea of what we mean by a surface being oriented if it has two sides, I'll start by looking at an example of a surface that is not oriented. Uh, and that'll be a Mobius strip, uh, if you've encountered that example before. So the way that you create a Mobius stri strip, start with a thin rectangle, uh, twist it once and then connect the edges. So notice that we have A and D are on the bottom while B and C are on the top. But then when we connect it, we've reversed those two pieces. So Mobius strip is like a thin strip of paper that just has a fold in the middle. And what that means is that there's only a single side to this Mobius strip, because if I go around it on what you know you might think of as the inside, by the time I come back around to that point on the Mobius strip, I'll have switched to being on the outside after I pass through that, uh, that twist in the thin surface. So Mobius strip is not oriented, uh, because again, it's only got the one side. Uh, but let's look at some examples of things that are oriented, uh, such as the two shapes listed in figure seven, 
uh, and define what I meant by an upwards orientation. So for something that's oriented upwards, uh, what we're going to do is choose whichever side of that orientation has normal vectors that point in the positive z direction. So a normal vector probably doesn't point only in the z direction unless we get a particularly lucky surface. Uh, so we'll look at all the, when we're going to look at the components of normal vectors, the x and y can kind of do whatever it wants. And I'm just gonna pay attention to the z component and pick the one that has a positive z component to be an upwards orientation. Uh, so we look at figure seven, the positive orientation is all the ones that has normal vectors pointing up, uh, while the negative orientation is the one that has all of its normal vectors pointing down. Uh, that'll be important in a little bit. So I wanna remember that definition. We'll also look at an outward orientation, uh, where if we're choosing that, this is going to be only for closed surfaces. Uh, so again, that example of the ball comes up actually in figures eight and nine. Uh, so the surface of a ball is enclosing some solid volume uh, and the positive orientation, if we're choosing an outward orientation, will be the one where all of the normal vectors point out. And a negative orientation will be one where the normal vectors point in. Uh, since you know, the normal vector could, both of those would be normal vectors. I just have two different options for which to choose. Uh, and let's also define a surface integral on a vector field. So the biggest difference between this definition and the one that we were using previously is now we have a vector function f instead of a scalar function. Uh, and so we're just gonna need to get a little bit creative with how we use ds. Uh, so notice on the left side of our definition, ds is a vector value. Uh, but by the time we're finished, we'll turn ds back into the scalar value that we've been using so far. Uh, so that's the goal with, with this new definition. So uh, if f is a continuous vector field, define an oriented surface f, s, lilla, with a normal vector n, and the surface integral over f, the surface integral of s over, of f over s. Why is that a tongue twister? Try it again. The surface integral of f over s is given by this equation, uh, where we'll just change f dot ds and its vector values into f dotted with the normal vector and then just times the scalar ds. So to relate this back to the things that we've already been using, we're probably still going to parameterize our surface s and that normal vector n, which is gonna need to be the unit normal vector, is probably going to be the cross product of the partial derivatives divided by the magnitude of that cross product. And as one last piece of terminology, uh, we usually call the surface integral of f over a region s is going to be called the flux of f across s. Uh, so if you've taken a physics course, you're probably familiar with flux already. Oh, all right. Let's go into a couple more definitions, or I guess this is a theorem. So we're gonna assume that we have a continuous vector field F on some oriented surface. Uh, then probably the way that we're actually gonna to want to calculate this stuff uh, is by again, switching that surface integral into a double integral like we've already been studying so far. Uh, so if we have a parameterization for S, which is again, can be represented by R, uh, then we can use the double integral where we have our vector field F dotted with the cross product of the partial derivative of that parameterization with respect to each of its two variables. Uh, and if we have S defined as explicitly as a surface Z that is equal to a function of X and Y, where X and Y are also in just a 2D region D, uh, then we can have, again, a double integral where we have F dotted with a rather special vector that I'll talk about more in a moment. So uh, first off, there are plus or minuses in these definitions uh, because that plus or minus is all gonna depend on the orientation that we choose. 
Uh, and like I, like I said, usually we're going to want to choose upward orientations or outward orientations, but again, that's only if we have a closed surface. Uh, and we should hopefully recognize the vector uh, g partial x g or g partial x g partial y one. Just notice that there's a bit of a typo right here. So we should fix that. So this should be g x or g partial x and then g partial y. G partial x. Wow, I did it again. G partial x, g partial y. Uh, we saw this specific vector show up when we took the cross product of those two partial derivative vectors of the parameterization of our surface. And I also want to rewrite those two vectors with the plus or minus taken into account. So if we're choosing to go with an upward orientation, which is probably going to make the most sense where we have a surface that is explicitly defined by z equals a function of x and y, then I wanted the positive orientation to be the one that has a positive component for z. So notice that when I say that we have a positive orient orientated vector, it's the one where the partials of g with respect to x and y get their negative values brought in, but that means that I have positive one for the z component of that vector compared to the negative orientation uh, where I have g partial x and g partial y are both positive, uh, but that z component was negative one. So when we're choosing to go with a positive oriented surface, the piece that we need to look at is just the z component rather than the x or the y components. Uh, also, if you're following along in the textbook, I want to look at the way that they have the formula written out. Uh, they're going to call their vector field FPQR, which has been pretty standard for the last few chapters. Uh, and they're going to just assume that we already have a positive orientation. Then we end up getting the double integral of negative P times G partial X minus Q times G partial Y plus R. And that's just multiplied by dA, which is the usual dA that we're used to uh, on some double integral. Uh, finally, one last note is that the function g comes from the parameterization of f, and it is not related to the vector field f. So it's the parameterization of s and not from f. Uh, so if we look at one last example, uh, we'll find the upward flex of f across a portion of the plane x, y, x plus y plus z equals one that's inside the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals one. So what do we do here? So first thing is I want to figure out what my surface is uh, and that surface is going to be the plane x plus y plus c equals one. Uh, it's got some bounds on it, which is where we get x squared plus y squared equals one, uh, but we're gonna use that when we set up the bounds of our integration. When we're just looking at trying to parameterize the surface, the thing we're looking to parameterize is the plane. Uh, and as it turns out, we don't actually need a parameterization this time because we can define that surface explicitly as a function of x and y. Specifically, it's z equals one minus x minus y. And since we wanted to get the upward flex, upward meaning we're going to take the positive orientation, uh, that means I'm gonna want a positive z component in that vector. So I'm gonna want the partial of z with respect, negative the partial of z with respect to x and negative partial of z with respect to y and one to be that vector. So if I take z partial x, I'm gonna get negative one. If I take z partial y, I'll also get negative one. So our vector ends up being negative, negative one, comma, negative, negative one, comma, one, which is really just the vector one, one, one. Cool. So that part comes out pretty nice. Uh, so then the flux is going to be the double integral of 
our field, which is x, y, z, but we're replacing z with 1 minus x minus y, dotted with the vector 1, 1, 1 times dA. It turns out the dot product of those two vectors is just 1. So I'm going to get an x and a minus x, and I'll get a y and a minus y. So it's only the one that survives. So I'm just looking at the integral, the double integral of dA, which I could just say right here is equal to pi r squared, where r is 1, uh, since I'm just getting the area of my region d. Uh, since now that I'm going back to looking at the region of d where x and y exist, uh, that's just the, the projection of the cylinder, which becomes the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1. Uh, so I could just stop right there and say, OK, I know this integral. It's going to come out to pi. Uh, but for the sake of showing a few more steps and kind of a more general, what do we do from here? Uh, I want to actually calculate this double integral which it looks like it's going to be easiest to do in polar coordinates. So I'm going to change dA to r times dr d theta. Just to make a quick note of that. dA is equal to r times dr d theta. Uh, and I need to go across that whole circle. So r is going to go between 0 and 1, and theta between 0 and 2 pi. And if we plug all that stuff in, we should just get pi.